director of urban director of urban transformation and and, and global trends laboratory in which uh, we have uh, led uh, the activity in spaces with neurodiverse publics projects that you will learn a little bit more later on uh, but to remember that this sem seminar brings uh, teams of experts from different countries to share their experience in projects about public space play and neurodiversity through this experience, the event uh, will open a debate about what has been done in Europe about this matter, what are the challenges to be addressed, and how we could tackle uh, these challenges. We have, as I said, uh, five uh, presentations. Uh, I will present each, um, each presentation at the beginning. So uh, let's start with the first project, if everything is, is all right, that is uh, presented by Valentina Talu of the Universidad de Sassari uh, on the architecture and design and urbanistic department that will present urban design and planning for autism. Uh, you, Valentina, very nice to meet you. And you have 10 minutes to tell us about urban design and planning for autism and, and your projects. Yes. I share my presentation. Let me know if you can see. We can see, we are seeing you. Yes, perfect. Okay. Thanks. And good morning, everyone. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank colleagues of Turba uh, Research Group for this welcome invitation and uh, the issue uh, of adapting urban spaces to the specific need of people with autism and more generally uh, of people with different disability disabilities is as relevant as uh, it is often uh, overlooked. Uh, so opportunities for this discussion, debate and dissemination such as this one are truly important and I'm, um, I am really happy to participate uh, today, so many thanks. Um, my name is Valentina Talu. I am a researcher of urban planning at the Department of Architecture, Design and Planning of the University of Sassari based in Alghero. Um, my research area uh, is the design of public policies and urban projects for the promotion of the quality of urban life of the most disadvantaged groups of uh, inhabitants, uh, children, women, uh, the elderly, and people with various disabilities. And in this framework, uh, I have explored the theme of the relationship between the built environment and autism in collaboration with my colleague uh, Giulia Tola and today I will present some results of this uh, uh, research. Um, there is no time today to go deeper but uh, I have uh, uh, nevertheless included in this slide uh, uh, the main theoretical references of the research. You certainly know better than me uh, the model of uh, biopsychosocial of disability uh, and the recent debate uh, around the opportunity to consider autism as uh, a neurodivergence uh, rather than a disorder. But uh, I am interested in briefly underlining the reference to the capability approach uh, theory, mainly developed by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, which is, has always been the main theoretical and methodological framework of uh, uh, my research. Uh, specifically, uh, the reference to capability approach theory has been used to define the so-called uh, atypical urban functionings of people with uh, autism, uh, the atypical sensory perception, the need to communicate uh, using uh, visual supports, and the need to follow a routine and temporal sequences to support the action. Uh, they represent the recurring problems <clears throat> that people with autism experience when interacting uh, with the built environment. Uh, they have been defined uh, both uh, through the study of scientific contributions uh, on the subject uh, and thanks to the comparison with experts from various uh, disciplinary fields uh, and with the representatives of the associations with which we have collaborated since the beginning of uh, the research. 
focusing on the atypical urban functionings of people with autism allows to select in a targeted manner and describe in a, an operative way uh, the urban barriers which make difficult and often uh, impossible to freely and fully enjoy the opportunities available in the cities. Uh, starting from the knowledge of the so-called atypical urban functionings, the research uh, aims were mainly uh, to propose a systematization of the knowledge gained on the design of built environment for uh, autism, uh, identifying a set of spatial requirements, and then to define a set of integrated urban policies and projects aimed at uh, promoting the possibility for people with autism to move within the city and to access urban areas, services and information. Um, in order to <clears throat> identify and describe the spatial requirements uh, for a design of the built environment attentive to the needs, the specific spatial needs of people with autism, we, we have carried out several, several activities. An international panel of 15 uh, experts in uh, autism, a uh, continuous comparison with the representatives of the associations operating in our context, in particular uh, ANSA ONLUS, uh, an analysis of uh, uh, autobiographies of people with autism, trying to uh, select the, uh, their considerations about the relationship between uh, autism and uh, the shape of, uh, of public space and uh, and the city in general, and uh, an analysis of relevant case studies. Uh, we also um, conduct, conducted a scoping review. I have included the reference here for uh, those interested in going to detail, uh, but the scoping review, uh, first of all, allow to highlight that the spatial requirements uh, introduced uh, in the literature mainly refer uh, to uh, three types of uh, spaces, schools and spaces for learning, uh, assisted living and care facilities and green uh, areas. And then it allows to identify a set of spatial requirements that uh, we have divided into three main thematic groups uh, uh, referring to the three atypical urban functionings, sensory quality, uh, the use of vis visual supports, and uh, intelligibility and predictability of the space. Um, in this slide, I have reported the example of the so-called quiet or escape or retreat uh, spaces. Um, the analysis uh, highlighted the fact that there is an almost total lack of research in the field of uh, autism-friendly design at the urban scale. Uh, most of the contribution, in fact, focus mainly on the requirements for designing specific buildings or delimited uh, green spaces. And moreover, the spaces are dedicated to people with autism and are almost always dedicated to children uh, with autism. Uh, therefore, the aim of our research was to try to translate these spatial requirements so that they can be used on a, an urban scale in order to provide a set of effective and usable guidelines for designing uh, autism-friendly urban actions and transformation. Um, our proposal on the promotion of uh, an urban environment attentive to uh, the specific spatial uh, needs of people with autism focuses on two different but, com but complementary areas of action. Firstly, the uh, identification and selection of uh, a set of urban mobility policies and measures capable of contributing to reduce the impact of some of the main barriers that, that people with autism face when uh, interacting with the urban environment, even if they are not specifically designed for people with uh, autism. 
Um, more specifically, they are capable to significantly mitigate the negative effects of acoustic and uh, others, other sensory uh, stimuli. Uh, the second area of, of action of our proposal refers to the creation of a well-structured set of experimental facilitating spatial solutions designed, specifically designed, referring to the specific spatial needs of people with autism and capable of increasing their capability to move within the city in order to assess spaces, service and information. Uh, we foc focus on low budget, modular and flexible solutions, which can be adapted to the characteristics of the given context and easily replicated following the principle of tactical urbanism uh, approach. <clears throat> Uh, the solution are meant to redesign, uh, even if only temporarily, uh, public and semi-public spaces, uh, especially the small-sized ones, and main neighborhood pathways, uh, in order to facilitate the, inter the interaction between people with autism and the urban environment, but also to support novel uses for the sake of all the inhabitants. Uh, this uh, solution can be uh, adjusted according to the feedback provided by the observation uh, of the behavior uh, of the users and especially by uh, their involvement. In this way, they represent also an opportunity and a tool to promote uh, the participation of people with autism in uh, urban design processes. Um, in this slide, uh, which uh, I can make available uh, to anyone uh, who is interested, uh, I have summarized the proposed solutions, uh, which are described in detail in the recently published book, Making Cities More Inclusive, uh, uh, which I have written with my colleague, Julia Tola. Um, I close my short presentation by briefly illustrating the activities that are currently uh, underway. Um, at the moment, uh, we are carrying out uh, a research and we are going to publish uh, a paper with the intent to explore synergies and possible conflicts between specific special needs of groups with, with different disabilities. The main goal is to answer the following question. Can we define solutions capable of of simultaneously intercepting a very diverse, diversified specific spatial need. Um, and also I am uh, collaborating in a participat participatory research project led by Marie Pierron, which uh, I think she will tell you about uh, later. Um, in addition to the research activity, we believe uh, it's now essential to carry out some experimental uh, actions, not only because they can be useful per se, uh, but also because we need them to test and possibly remodel the solution we have proposed uh, in our framework. I mentioned two in particular. We are uh, um, at the moment uh, design the project for the street school in a small, small town in Sardinia of about uh, 5,000 inhabitants, which will, will allow us to experiment some solution uh, relating to urban signage. We are planning to create uh, uh, the, uh, an urban visual agenda uh, to support children along their home school journeys. And then the project for the redesign of a public green area in uh, another municipality in, uh, in Sardinia, who is promoted by a social cooperative uh, with which we are collaborating uh, with. Uh, so I finish because my time is uh, over and thank you very much again for uh, this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina, for, for just starting, uh, making the kickoff of, of this exciting meeting and having a very interesting and as well keeping uh, on time your presentation. Uh, just uh, let me remind you as well that uh, uh, we have the question as my colleague Paco, uh, uh, who, is the, who is the manager of, of, this, of this Zoom meeting, has put in the, 
uh, in the chat, uh, you have as the chat, but as well uh, the section of questions and answers below in your menu in Zoom. If you have a question about the presentation, uh, please, if you have a specific question that is about understanding very specific things that, that didn't get clear for the, any of the panel's presenters, please uh, say so there. As well, if you have a more general question, you can put it there and then at the beginning at the end of the of, of the of the presentations we will uh, cover uh, cover all of them so after valentina uh, i would like to to give the floor to uh, uh, marie pierron of the integrative neuroscience and cognition center of the university de paris uh, with her presentation autism spectrum disorder a singular perception of the city please marie the floor is yours Um, so, um, firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this meeting because uh, I think it's a novel topic and uh, the approach um, is uh, very uh, innovative to build an inclusive city with the participation of uh, local authorities, uh, some scientists in different fields, uh, some urbanists, and uh, also some people with autism spectrum disorder. So uh, very thank you for uh, this invitation. I will present a participatory science uh, project on sensoriality in the city for people with uh, autism spectrum disorder. And uh, you can see on the right of the screen, uh, a drawing made by a young um, art graphic student and this is a representation of um, the perception of the city there is really uh, a lot of uh, uh, visual uh, stimuli uh, in uh, in his drawing so my presentation uh, will be in uh, three parts firstly i will talk about the main result uh, of neuroscience research uh, in visual perception for this uh, for people with autism spectrum disorder uh, if i choose to present only the visual aspects it's because 80 percent of information is processed by the visual system so uh, vision is uh, really essential for human behavior and uh, secondly I will um, ask the question about the relevance of this uh, neuroscience research for the design of a playground. And uh, finally, I will discuss the interest of uh, multidisciplinary participatory research to improve knowledge on the sensory particularity of people with ASD, but also to adapt the environment to their uh, sensory particularities. So um, at the A level, uh, research, uh, neuroscience researcher found that people with autism spectrum disorder have more ophthalmological disorder than people without uh, autism spectrum disorder. More specifically, uh, they present uh, refractive error, amblyopia, and strabismus. But there is also another atypicality, which is uh, interesting. It's uh, atypicalities for pupil reaction. Uh, in fact, the pupil um, is involved when, uh, when the light uh, enters into the eyes. And um, maybe uh, everybody knows some people with autism spectrum disorder uh, will report uh, some, uh, that the light hurts them when, uh, when they see it. So maybe uh, this feeling could uh, result in part from the atypicalities uh, for pupil reaction. And we, on, we not only observe the atypicality of pupil reaction in response to light, but also for a more attentional process, such like uh, cognitive load or uh, emotional content. And uh, always at the eye level, uh, there is also some uh, functional and structural retinal uh, abnormalities. So um, at the eye level, there is really a lot of uh, atypicalities or uh, abnormalities in some people with autism spectrum disorder, not in all people. And uh, this aspect reflects the notion of spectrum. But these uh, difficulties at the eye level could contribute to an atypical uh, visual perception of the environment. Now we will look at at a more integrated level because it's at uh, the brain level and half of the brain area um, is implicated to the, is involved to uh, the uh, brain uh, process uh, information visual information so uh, at a basic 
uh, level uh, in the primary visual cortex, which is the first structure in the brain uh, involved in the uh, process of uh, visual perception. Uh, so there is some uh, atypicalities at this level. And uh, for, uh, for example, when, uh, when uh, people with autism spectrum disorder uh, look at uh, some contrast, some brightness, um, their uh, primary visual cortex doesn't uh, uh, react as the same as uh, people without autism spectrum disorder. And uh, maybe all the same contain visual information, such as brightness and contrast. So we could uh, wonder about the consequences of this atypical uh, visual processing for simple visual information uh, on more complex information, such like uh, motion or uh, face. So people with autism spectrum disorder have also some difficulties in the perception of global motion or uh, for biological motion. And the global motion is uh, when you look at uh, a group of birds flying, it's a global motion. And the local motion, it's only when we look at one bird. And people with autism spectrum disorder don't have any difficulties for local motion, but only for global motion. And they have also difficulties for biological motion. And when you talk, you uh, move your mouth and it's a biological motion. And these difficulties for uh, perception of motion is not uh, only for people with autism disorder, but we also find in other neurodevelopmental disorders such like dyslexia. And the, one of the most complex uh, visual information for the brain is uh, face. And people with autism spectrum disorder have difficulties with face recognition, identification, and also uh, for visual exploration of the face. Here, you can see that um, the A's are not, uh, are not explored uh, by uh, this, uh, this uh, participant with autism spectrum disorder. And this part of the face are uh, very important for social interaction. So, Norsen's finding allow to have an accurate characterization of the sensory particularity of people with autism spectrum disorder in very controlled condition. But there is very few neuroscience studies in the everyday environment and few studies that include the voice of people with autism in addition to uh, biological uh, data. So here uh, you can see a picture uh, of a playground. And uh, if you uh, taking into account all uh, the uh, visual uh, perception atypicalities I presented uh, in my first part, you can uh, imagine that uh, this, uh, this playground is not uh, really uh, suitable uh, for uh, young children with autism spectrum uh, disorder. For example, for uh, children uh, who uh, could be uh, very hypersensitive to the light, the brightness of the slide uh, could be uncomfortable or even painful. The eye contrast between the floor and the pass uh, could be also uh, uncomfortable. And there is uh, another parameter uh, that uh, we need to take into account. It's uh, the difficulties for uh, prioritization. There is a lot of color, a lot of detail, a lot of shape in this playground. And people with uh, autism spectrum uh, disorder have uh, difficulties uh, in selecting and uh, processing the relevant information uh, to uh, perform an action. And I only present the result uh, for the visual aspect, but uh, when you are uh, uh, in the street, uh, you are stimulated by uh, a lot of uh, sensory uh, sources. Um, here, uh, for example, uh, if you touch uh, this slide, uh, uh, there is a temperature of, uh, of, uh, of these materials. Um, the rearing is also uh, involved. Uh, for example, when uh, children uh, walk on, uh, on, this, uh, on this structure, it makes a sound, and these sounds uh, could be uncomfortable for people with autism spectrum uh, disorder. And there is also two other aspects uh, which are not present on the, on the picture, but uh, which are uh, uh, difficult for people with autism spectrum disorder. It's the face and uh, also the motion. Um, in uh, on this playground, uh, a lot of children uh, could run around it uh, in different direction, 
And uh, so uh, people with autism spectrum disorder have difficulties with the perception of global motion. So it could be uh, really difficult. And uh, um, there could be also uh, animals like bee uh, will fly uh, in the air. And it could be another uh, uh, visual uh, stimulus that could be uh, difficult uh, to uh, uh, treat for people with autism spectrum disorder. And I would add um, another uh, particularities uh, which are very important for people with autism spectrum disorder is the heterogeneity. Uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity at the behavioral level. For example, uh, a people could be hyposensitive to uh, a visual stimuli, uh, while another one uh, could be hypersensitive to the same uh, stimulus. Uh, and this uh, heterogeneity could also be observed at uh, a biological level when you record the electrical brain activity, uh, when you present the same uh, stimulus a lot of time, you will observe a lot of variability uh, in the electrical activity of the brain for people with autism spectrum disorder, and uh, there isn't the same variability for people without autism spectrum disorder. So how to produce recommendation for the sensory design of the city for people with autism spectrum disorder uh, with all the, this new age uh, in neuroscience. So maybe um, the participatory research uh, could uh, contribute uh, to, uh, um, to a better representation of the visual uh, particularities of people with autism spectrum disorder. In this type of research, uh, they bring together scientists and non-scientists recognizing the expertise of each other. So uh, in this kind of research, uh, people with autism spectrum disorder uh, contribute with their uh, expertise, uh, usage expertise, uh, local core activities, uh, which want to better accommodate uh, people with autism spectrum disorder uh, in school, uh, for example, or in a public space. And also, there are uh, the scientists. And uh, in, in uh, our study, we use uh, this approach. So uh, we made the two workshops. And uh, in this workshop, there will be 180 participants. And at the end, we, we think that we need to have uh, uh, something uh, to uh, share with uh, other people uh, who don't uh, participate to our project. So uh, we, uh, we write a booklet. And in this booklet, there are uh, all the main results in neuroscience, urbanism, and architecture. There is also some example of adaptation of the environment to sensory particularity of people with ASD, and some testimony of people uh, with uh, ASD or their parents. And uh, this booklet is uh, dedicated to uh, association and local authority who wish to learn more about the subject but also want to uh, carry out uh, some uh, micro project uh, in the city. And finally, I will present the uh, project uh, uh, of uh, a new project, a uh, new participatory uh, research project on sensory need of people with autism spectrum uh, disorder, which has been initiated by uh, local authorities, uh, Grand Orly saint Dièvre. Uh, it's a local authority just near Paris, and uh, with researcher. Uh, Valentina Talu, in fact, and uh, 10 other researchers and uh, people with autism spectrum disorder. And this uh, project has uh, three main uh, objectives. The first one is to promote peer supporting by sharing solutions for getting around in the city. The second one is to uh, identify materials and urban facilities adapted to the sensory atypicality of people with ISD. And the last one, more for a neuroscientist researcher, is to study perception in situ when walking. And at the end of this project, a free kit will be designed and can be used after by other local authorities or association to carry out a sensory evaluation on a specific uh, pass or, uh, or um, a specific space uh, in, uh, in their city. So uh, thanks for your attention and thanks to uh, all, uh, all the people uh, mentioned uh, on, on this slide. Thank you very much, Marie, for a clear uh, and very interesting presentation, adding up uh, to Valentina's presentation and bringing new points and, and as well seeing uh, um, transversal topics that, that I'm pretty sure that will emerge later on the debate. Also, uh, I would like to thank Mario and Diane and, and the students for the, for the nice, nice, nice illustrations that also make 
uh, very nice presentation. So uh, now we move to Wales uh, with Maria Manello that um, she will present play and public space reflections from Wales. Uh, uh, Ma Marianne is, is from the organization uh, Play Wales. Please, Ma Marianne, the floor is yours. Buenos dias, buongiorno, uh, borada. That's good morning in Welsh, but I will be speaking English. So good morning. Hopefully you can see my slides. Um, I'm Marianne Manello and I work um, at Play Wales um, in the UK. Um, the session will briefly explore the policy background here in Wales. We'll share some information about research into place efficiency here in Wales and discusses some active research interventions that we're undertaking here. Um, play Wales is the NGO for children's play in Wales. We are the national charity. We are a rights-based organization and campaign for what we call a play-friendly Wales, um, believing that children have legitimate rights to use public space um, in their neighborhoods and further afield. A little bit about Wales. Um, hopefully you've um, heard of us. Um, we are um, a small country in the United Kingdom. Our capital is Cardiff and we have a devolved government. So um, many of our services, including children's services, education, health and social care, including children's play are devolved from the United Kingdom government to um, the Welsh Parliament known as Seneth Cymru. Um, we have um, a, just under, as our latest um, census, just under 700,000 children living and playing here in Wales. And um, we are made up of 22 municipalities of varying sizes, um, many of them quite small in comparison to um, other UK nations. I wanted to just start by reminding ourselves how important play is. This isn't a presentation about play, but it's important that we remind ourselves how important it is for all children, um, supporting socialization, building and boosting emotional um, skills and resilience, crucial for good health and well-being, really supports children to feel part of their neighborhoods and supports learning and development. And all of that is really, really important uh, for children in terms of long-term outcomes. Um, but children tell us that playing is very, very important for them right now. And I'd like to hold on to that. As a rights-based organization, um, we Play Wales um, works to and responds to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I'm sure all of you um, have heard about. Um, the right to play is enshrined in Article 31. And from time to time, when the Committee on the Rights of the Child feels that one of the articles isn't well understood, it issues further guidance um, for um, countries um, called general comments and in general comment number 17 the the committee explains in further detail about the importance of play um, and a little bit of context one of the um issues that the united committee um, calls on you um, governments and state parties um, globally to consider introducing legislations to ensure the rights under article 31 including the rights to play are insured for children. Um, and so here in Wales, we have what are known as the play, have become known as the Wales Place Efficiency Duties. Through um, legislation in 2010, Welsh government introduced laws around play. And each mun municipality needs to undertake a full assessment of opportunities to play in their area and submit it to our Welsh government every three years. So the most recent ones were just submitted in June of 2022. Municipalities must also complete an annual action plan and submit that to Welsh government. And they must also produce an annual progress report um, on that action plan, on reporting on what they've done to secure opportunities for play in their areas. 
Welsh Government, in its guidance to local authorities, municipalities around its place efficiency duties, talks very much about making communities more play friendly. And it talks about the three conditions uh, which are important for children's play, for the rights to be realised, and that includes having enough time to play, um, that the psychological features, so permission to play either from other adults or um, children feeling allowed to play are important against good quality spaces. So the conditions for play are very much temporal, spatial, psychological, time, space and permission to play. Very important for children. We've commissioned some research into the place efficiency duties um, and I haven't got time to go into great detail but the summaries of each of that um, those studies are available on the Play Wales website um, but the conclusions in terms of today's discussion is the how important play is valued for its role in well-being in the here and now as well as those future focused benefits those development benefits that we talked about very early on in my discussion uh, the, the sufficiency research has established children's right to play as a matter of spatial justice. So play sufficiency here in Wales is about holding spatial habits and routines up to scrutiny to see how um, effective they are in supporting children to find time and space to play. And so for our municipalities here in Wales, assessing and securing opportunities to play is very much dependent on developing and maintaining the conditions that support playing, the temporal, spatial and psychological conditions. And that involves paying attention through creative research um, to how space works and how it can be open um, for children's play so that children can get the best out of the opportunities on offer for their play. In terms of other research, we've engaged with children um, to find out about what they think about play. Now, these are the, the findings from the 2019 Place Efficiency Assessments. We're cur currently analyzing the 2022 um, returns. But children talk about, according to, to our children's survey, children ask for places to climb, jump, look for bug, bugs, and to hide. Um, and modern day children still like to make dens and meet up with friends, make forts, all of the sorts of things that we probably remember from our own childhoods. And in our report, um, children report that when they are allowed out and able to play in the places they want to, they are generally happy with quality spaces. However, more recently, the place where children are reporting most likely to play with their friends is their back garden, their backyards, um, or a friend's backyards, family members' backyards, rather than in their neighborhoods. Um, and for us, for Play Wales, we want to see children more present in communities. We want to get them in the fronts of their houses, not in the backs um, of their houses. So we, um, as part of our manifesto asks here in Wales, we wanted to learn from um, what children have are telling us and also from some of the impact of the global pandemic. So here in Wales, when we experienced lockdown, we found that there were some positive aspects in terms of children's access to space. Our streets were quieter. Our neighbors were more present, were more um, helpful to one another. Um, there were playful interventions in communities here in Wales. The importance of playing was valued. Our national guidance talked about how important it was for children to play, to support them through the uncertainties and stresses that the global pandemic um, was presenting. And so we are calling for better use of outdoor community assets, drawing on what children tell us and on some action research. And that includes very briefly looking at promoting better use of streets. So temporarily closing streets to open them up for children to play in. Um, and also looking at the grounds around schools and how they can be more accessible when the teaching 
day ends um, for children who may not have access to space in their neighborhoods, may not have the back gardens that so many children tell us are important to them. Um, one of the things that we're doing um, that's ongoing at the moment is we are piloting an app with child health researchers at Swansea University, which will allow children to um, judge and rate uh, the spaces where they like to play. And that's an ongoing um, piece of work that we're hoping to report on um, relatively soon. We have a range of resources um, to support local authorities here in Wales and their partners to think about that better use of community assets. So we have two guides around street play, one for municipalities and one for local residents. And we have a guide for schools to consider how it can make um, how they can make their spaces more available for children and families to use after school. In terms of the action research, um, the all of the, um, the feedback from our projects around street play um, have been positive and children very much talk about having space, being outside, um, saying they've played near the street before, but there's not a lot of children there. Um, they like drawing big pictures with chalk, so having bigger space um, to use and to feel part of. In terms of the school grounds project, um, in a nutshell, parents like it because it feels like a sanctioned space. They feel that it's a place where they can relax, enjoy the company and socialization of other parents, knowing that the school has made sure that any hazards have been removed for, for children to play in. Um, and that's been particularly useful for families that may not have access to their own um, private space. Um, and just finishing in terms of what what children tell us um, in that latest research with children in terms of satisfaction of their neighborhood play spaces, when we asked, um, one of the questions we asked is what's good about your area for, for hanging out, for playing in? What's the best thing about your favorite place? And I always hold on to this quote. And in terms of today's discussion, um, this one boy who's nine years old said that the best thing for him about his favorite place to play was that there are lots of places to jump and run on and move on. And that helps him with his ADHD. And so for that, that for me, that's a very, very powerful message from a child, from a nine year old who is very aware of his his um, surroundings and is saying, if you give me places to jump and move and run and hide, I can manage my own well-being for, for periods of time. If you take that away, I can't. If you don't provide for it, I can't. So give me places that help me to manage my life and my own well-being. Thank you, Mariam, for an excellent presentation again that complements the, the previous two and bringing the policy dimension uh, to the debate. So uh, we're moving from, from Wales uh, a little bit uh, east towards England. And now we have uh, Georgia Aidenhead, um, Helen Duncan, Bastian Grace Sheik, uh, and Zoaras, and Otis Smith uh, from the Alan Turing Institute that will present Auto Spaces, co creating a citizen science platform. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and really interesting presentation so far, and we hope to bring a slightly different angle. And thank you, Georgia, for sharing our slides. As, as you heard, we are four speakers, and we will try to make it quick, as we will be talking about our project, which is OutSpaces, where we co-create a citizen science platform. And OutSpaces, can you move to the next slide? Thanks. OutSpaces is a project that's trying to do research for real world change. And it stands as an acronym, it stands for Autism Research into Sensory Processing for Accessible Community Environments. And what we've tried to do is participatory research to really co-create an open source citizen science platform to address challenges around this question. 
And we have three main goals with this, which are sharing people's stories and adaptive techniques with others who have similar experiences, but also educate neurotypical people to better support their friends, family, and colleagues. And lastly, advise organizations on how they can design and adapt spaces to improve people's lives. And importantly, as I said before, this is a participatory citizen science project where we strive to empower autistic people throughout the process. So we are really trying to do research with the community. And we are a team. I'm Bastik Rasaka Savaras. I just started at the Alan Turing Institute in London as a senior researcher. And we are working with a large community. And we have some representatives here today. So there's Georgia Aitken, head the research associate in our group, Otis Smith, who is one of our contributors, and Helen Duncan, who will talk a bit about the development of the platform from an engineering perspective. And with this, I will hand it over to Georgia to talk a bit about the history, the challenge of the project. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we um, are doing art spaces to address some specific challenges. Um, the first one being that depending on the study around 90% of autistic people process sens sensory information differently from non autistic people. And we went into a lot of detail about that in terms of um, visual processing. We also know there's a huge amount of compounding effects. So multiple sensory inputs can have a very different effect to a single one. And that people are affected um, differently and individually and that this can have a huge impact on autistic people's lives. Um, so here are just a few of the kinds of spaces that participants in art spaces told us um, were uncomfortable or even completely inaccessible to them. Public parks, schools and universities, public transport, workplaces and hospitals being just a few. And we think of this as being not because there's a disability that autistic people have, but because there is, we use a social model um that autistic people are often interacting with spaces that were not built with them in mind um the questions that um art spaces is investigating are actually community priorities which were identified by autistica which is the research charity that funds the project originally um and they identified 10 top questions for autism research consulting over a thousand people majority of whom were autistic um, and they found that um, answering the question which environments or supports are most appropriate in terms of achieving the best life outcomes in autistic people and how can sensory processing in autism be better understood were high priority questions um, that people wanted answered. Um, so the approach we've taken, rather like uh, many of these other presentations today, has been highly participatory. Um, we're co-developing a citizen science platform, so this will be an online space where autistic people can share their experiences. And this will allow us to access qualitative data at scale. It's research design driven by a community. We want it to be reflective of the autistic population, so have a sense of the diversity of autistic experiences, and um, also focus on real world experiences, as Marie was saying as well. Um, there is more lab-based research than there is real world research, which involves people interacting with their usual environments. So we want this to have an impact which supports the community. Um, we're driven by a philosophy which comes from the disability rights movement of nothing about us without us. So we have a thoroughly participatory approach. This involves going from consultation to collaboration. So one of the first things that we did was hold scoping sessions to understand what kind of needs that our research could meet and what were the priorities. And from these, we then went into more um, specific focus groups um, focusing on the design of the platform and other priorities that emerge from scoping sessions and we've done extensive one-to-one -one co-working with committed collaborators otis who is here with us is one of those collaborators um, and he's going to give a take on his experience of being a citizen scientist with art spaces so i'm going to hand over to otis hello my name is otis smith i'm a member of the art spaces project since joining the project, I've taken away a lot of experience and gained so much insight and, and I can appreciate how, how long and how hard it can be to find a way between not, not necessarily understanding, but how to kind of find a balance between inclusivity, but all as well as other aspects. Being a part of the project has resulted in me becoming more familiar and content with how not only how I feel the project but how there's a greater community feel to, to it together. In addition, being able to share ideas 
and work with such an amazing, easy going, friendly, safe and welcome community. I've taken away a lot of experience and a lot of insight from this. The benefits and opportunities that come from being a part of the group offer such clarity and depth, not only, not only just the things that matter to us, but as well as in everyday life and as well as in different situations. We approach things with a clear, non judgmental way and vision. We cover a wide range of different topics and we will us know as well as implementing and referring to the project. We actively collaborate and discuss together to reduce the solution in the hope of making a difference to autistic people. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Otis. Otis has been doing really amazing work, including um, working on how we can understand people's experiences and the difference between direct and indirect reporting of experiences, which has become part of the methodology for analyzing the qualitative data that we've collected so far. So Otis has been incredible. <laughs> um, so we've gone from consultation to co-creation. So here's a little example of how that works. Um, we had a series of community discussions where people talked about the kinds of features and functions that they would like a citizen science platform to have. These became design decisions and we co-worked and continue to work with autistic community members as well as open source community members on building the platform um, followed by those prioritized um, pieces of feedback from autistic people um, and I can see that Robin has joined so thank you Robin he's one of our amazing um, volunteer developer collaborators um, and these then became design iterations to build a platform which is built by the community and for the community um, a big focus that emerged from our uh, consultation sessions was the importance of data and agency and we have striven to have the highest standards of data protection, including consent that is dynamic and informed. And um, one of the, I think, most interesting parts of this project, from my point of view, has been a co-created data management and moderation strategy for the online space. We've been talking a lot about physical spaces, but this is an online space. Um, and unfortunately, autistic people are often disadvantaged online. They're more likely to experience abuse, exploitation, bullying um, and exclusion. Um, so how do we make a citizen science platform that is welcoming and inclusive for a diverse range of autistic people? Um, to do this, we held a specific collaborative workshop just to address this issue. And we appointed two citizen science co-leads, um, Susanna and James, who have been leading on developing the moderation strategies. Uh, they've run user personas, um, done a lot of community engagement and produced a tailored code of conduct and moderation strategy um, and here is a little example of one of their solutions um, so we had to balance the difficulty of not wanting to censor autistic people's experiences publicly because they were negative um, autistic people's negative experiences are a huge part of their lived world and reality and it would be um, it would cease to be validating of those experiences if we just censored them out. But at the same time, we found that a lot of people talked about being triggered by negative content and not wanting to read it um, and having a variety of different triggers based on their own previous traumas or um, sensitivities. Um, so we came. So Susanna and James came up with this traffic lights rating system with red for anything which breaks the code of conduct, which we wouldn't publish. Green meets all requirements and amber is something that doesn't break the code of conduct but contains potentially triggering content so it can be flagged and individuals can tag those experiences. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Helen who's been doing amazing work developing the platform and she will give a bit of a run through of what spaces. Uh, thank you very much. So if we just go to the next slide, these are just going to be a few um, screenshots of the platform as we have it at the moment, we're still in development. So um, users can enter their own stories and they can add uh, triggering labels. There's a few selected ones or they, there's a free text box as well. And they can decide how and want, how and if they want to share their data. So at the bottom there we've got sharing options on the web page. Um, there's shares for Altspace's website and there's shares for research as well. And if we just go on to the next slide. 
Um, all the stories that users submit will be available to them via the My Stories page, and you can download and edit and delete the stories um, as and when you want to. Stories are moderated by community members, and you might be able to see here that we have uh, story number three is a non-public story. So it's a story that a user has submitted, but they don't want to share with the public or with alt spaces. So you can access it via the site, but it's not something that we hold ourselves. And um, stories that have been moderated are then, and that users have decided to share are then visible to all visitors on the site. And if we just go on to the next slide, we've got an example of that. So here's what the shared stories would look like. We've kind of got placeholder text at the moment, but we can see that the non-public story isn't visible. Um, and these are stories that have been moderated and stories that have uh, triggering tags are highlighted and you can expand to read the stories that you're interested in. Thank you. And that's it from our side. So thank you very much for all of you for listening to us. And of course, we are, as I said, a big team. So we have seen four of us here today, but there's many more people that have been involved from many different institutions and volunteer contributors that were really key. And thank you so much to all of them, of course, as well. And thanks so much to you again. Thank you very much, Bastian, Georgia, Otis, and Helen. Very, 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 very thankful that you could share your experience and, and as working in the in Internet Interdisciplinary Institute. I think that that you bring another dimension to the of complexity because I think that we cannot talk about uh, public space or playable uh, play spaces without talking about the digital space. Uh, so, so uh, we have another layer, as I said. So last. Uh, um, we move to uh, Barcelona um, to Blanca and Raquel, uh, Blanca Calvo Pouchet, that is the IP of the project uh, that we, we will be present, and Raquel, that is the co investigator. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, can you see our screen? Blanca, Raquel, can you speak a little bit louder, please? Can you see our screen? Yeah, we can see the screen, but we cannot hear you very well. Okay, so be louder. Um, so no. thanks everyone for coming today, and thanks for the presentations. It's been super interesting, and also it's it's quite good. It's a, it's a very good background for what we're going to talk because we're going to present the two outputs that we developed through this project. Uh, I believe. Do you, do you see the zoom part covering up part of our screen or can you see the slides well we can we can see perfectly the screen so okay worry. okay so um my name is blanca calvo uh, um, i work for the open university of catalonia and together with raquel who's here with me we're going to be presenting the project we've worked in uh with paco and ramon and there's been also other institutions involved in this has been a, a neuroscience the uh, center uh, called IGAIN. Um, they do therapy with children with autism. Uh, there's an association called LEMUR that work with children and play spaces in, particip in a participatory manner. And we also work with the University of Barcelona. I, yeah, I <laughs> with the local uh, government of Barcelona, sorry, uh, several entities there. And this has been a six month project that's been funded by the new European Bauhaus. It's quite applied research compared especially compared to what we've seen so far <laughs> so we're going to give you a short overview of the project and then we'll jump straight to the two outputs so we're trying to switch slide wait oh, we can't for some reason um, computer is not working can you hear us we can hear you very well. Uh, now Paco is, uh, is coming to help you with the technicalities, but yes, we believe that going on. presentation Please stopped do. working. So maybe yeah. somebody else will have to share the screen. Um, but I'm going to start explaining with the project without the slide. So basically the focus of this project was to include improve public spaces and particularly play areas for children with autism and their families. And was to do it with them and for them. And the way we did this was by creating knowledge, <laughs> um, knowledge tools and methods uh, targeting 
architects and urban designers and people who work in the local administration. So when they design um, these spaces, um, they do it understanding the problematics that these people find and also how to mitigate them. And basically, okay, this is the slide. Um, basically, we're talking about two documents that we produce. The first one is the design guidelines and Raquel is going to present that. And the second one is a co-creation methodology to include this collective when you do a participatory process. Um, the last thing I want to say about this slide is that our focus was on um, ensuring that they can enjoy their right to play. So the focus was very much on ensuring that they can go outside and enjoy their time. So this is the process that we did. We're not going to talk about the all the research activities, but basically we conducted the literature review. Uh, we looked at autism and nature, autism and public space. Um, there was quite a bit about it. And the other topic we looked at was autism and participation. We must say it was very difficult to find stuff there. So that was the most challenging. We went to the park, we did four visits with six families and, and their children in the park. We had held informal interviews there. We had an, advi an advisory board. We held two meetings with them that was very useful. There were experts from different, different disciplines that helped us a lot. We distributed the survey through two local um, ASD associations that have, have helped us a lot in the process. We had 85 responses. And we held four participatory workshops. Uh, I'm going to show some images of that because that's possibly the centerpiece of our project. And after the workshop, we sent a survey to the participants. Uh, we'll explain later why was this. And with this information, we did the first version of the documents that we then verified in two discussion sessions, one per document, where we had experts, but also um, families and associations participating. And, and basically what came out of all of these are the two documents we're going to show now. So these are images from the workshops. And it was a temporary installation that we set up in, in a park here in Barcelona. Um, and basically the idea was to give a lot of play options and let children come and play. We'll talk a bit about the facilitation later also. Um, and what you see on the right, there was a storyline that was distributed through the our exposing autism to the families so that they had a bit of anticipation. And these are the maps that we produced when we were on site. So basically we had a base map with all the elements that were there and we were mapping each of us was following one child, mapping constantly what they were doing, trying to map how long they spent in each thing, uh, the type of stimulus that were activated, et cetera. We also had the experts in autism mapping uh, autism specific data. It was, uh, they used a curriculum called, called Denver, is one of the, the curriculums they use in therapy, and they were mapping some specific stuff. And with this, we're going to jump to the project results. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, as Blanca was saying, one of the documents that uh, has been the result, and it's already in our website, is this friendly design handbook uh, that it's all the like recommendations for uh, design of public playgrounds uh, sensible for ASD children. Uh, it's organized in four uh, general uh, chapters. Uh, first one, it's the general characteristics of the play space. So uh, we were collecting the, this information and uh, it, it uh, turned out like these sub chapters of a reduction of external stimuli, uh, escapism mitigation, intuitive and easily navigable spaces, surveillance spaces and easy access for parents, and also uh, try to not separate the game elements by age, but instead uh, by activities, type of activities or type of play. Also uh, regarding play elements, um, uh, it uh, incorporates uh, increase the sensory play, adapt uh, motor games, uh multifunctional elements also include calm spaces so in case the children need to uh have like a moment of um, relax uh, they can find a calm space in the playground uh, also how to manage waiting times um as maybe it's difficult for them to understand they have to wait for a specific game and also uh, to find solutions to easy transitions, because it's also difficult um, to, to go from uh, one play element to another or to go from the, from the playground to uh, outside. 
um, also some uh, guidelines on management of the space. So also there's um, a municipal uh, initiative in Barcelona that has been going on like a pilot that it's uh, to have facilitators or mediators in uh, some specific parks. Uh, so we were thinking that this figure could be also uh, someone that has uh, um, a bit of experience with uh, autistic children and could be, uh, be doing this figure or like uh, mediating between children, also helping with transitions, helping with the managing of the time. So also could create some sensibility uh, among families uh, um, that are in the park. And then also another point was the non-permanent material management, because we uh, understood that there are elements that can be also brought from uh, our own houses. So maybe um, the materials that we have in the park um, are not enough or are not the type of elements that uh, children would like to have. So maybe um, having permanent um, structures that can allow uh, these ephemeral elements to, to be hanged or to be kept. Uh, this is something that also has to do with management a lot. So uh, it's something that should be um, like discussed uh, with um, like political um, in, in, in like publics. And then other measures would be uh, an awareness campaign. This is something that uh, families were um, like speaking a lot. Uh, the lack of uh, awareness uh, when they go to the park. Um, also, information about the use of the game elements. Um, also, a low participation in giving voice to families. Uh, from all of that, we were suggesting the creation of an app or a website that could include all of this. So you could have an app that can give you information of the use of the game elements in a specific parks. You could have pictures of the park so uh, families can show their children the specific park they are going to avoid frustration if they are not going to the park they are imagining and also could be a um, like a place to give voice to families so they could also rate or give comments to specific parks uh we were we were touching like physical um uh, suggestions like we are working with a specific uh, physical space but there are transversal topics of security and social issues that have always been there and that we cannot avoid uh, but was not the main focus of our project but of course they are uh, transversal in in all the guidelines so here are some this is an image that was meant to be an example of uh, what it is uh, uh, intuitive and easy to navigate the space. Maybe you can use the, the pavement or different colors uh, to create this type of a structure for their children to understand and to be navigate better the space. Um, also a safe space approach and wayfinding and a universal accessibility. So we have some suggestions here. Um, also, uh, in, in terms of easy access and surveillance uh, to ensure visibility for parents uh, in all the areas of the park. Uh, also ensuring that adults can reach their child in, um, in any play element of the, of the park. If there's uh, like a dysregulation moment to ensure that parents can go and, and reach their children. So also we have some suggestions here in terms of physical uh, distribution. Um, very important to include these calm and heaven spaces uh, so children can find these quiet spaces uh, in the playground. Um, and also um, in general in the area, we were uh, understanding that generally the area has to be try to reduce external stimuli. So it would be nice to be like a calm space uh, in general but also to have these specific uh, calm spaces uh, would help children in moments of maybe overstimulation. And then uh, another important issue was managing the waiting time. So uh, I think there are many possibilities in this aspect on how to incorporate maybe activities that can help uh, waiting and not just be uh, looking at the game ele play element, but also having something to do while you wait, but also to include visual supports that explain these waiting rules. 
um, and as we were saying, the management of these non-permanent elements that um, maybe families can bring from home, like this having these permanent structures where you can hang swings or fabrics, uh, maybe including containers that can uh, be managed by the city council. Um, and you can uh, have some per non-permanent elements there uh, to play in the park. And as I was saying, the creation of a NAP that can include the information of the use of play elements that can help with anticipation for families and also give a voice. Um, and now I will give the word to Blanca. So we're going to switch now to the creation guide. So basically, this is a document for anyone who wants to create a park from scratch or to upgrade an existing one to make it inclusive and wants to do it with the participation of these children and their families. And this one is structured in two sections. There's a section for the actors and roles. And then we have the phases we split before the workshop, during the workshop, after the workshop. It is process similar to the one we follow. And for each of these steps, there are practical considerations and, and some specific ideas. So we're going to show you a few. So one of the steps before the workshop is to prepare the, the data collection uh, process. And one important thing to say here is to decide what's approach of the project. So we know we want to break the path to make it more inclusive, but something we stumbled on, especially with the advisory board, was what do you expect this park to do? Uh, so as I said, our objective was to make sure that the children can have plan, plan and they can enjoy it. But there were also requests that maybe they learn uh, or that the parents can relax, etc. So basically, there's several approaches and each team will have to choose theirs. And depending on what they want to do, they will have to collect specific data. And then there are the three sets of data. The autism specific data, which we, we recommend to use these curriculums that exist uh, from therapy. And, and basically, there's several abilities and you check those that are relevant to what you're trying to achieve. Then the data about what children do, this is the maps that we showed you earlier. And then that on children's emotion and play and play preference, sorry. This is something I also want to stress that something we learn is that uh, sometimes a child with autism smiling doesn't mean that they're happy. Or sometimes they not doing something doesn't mean they don't want to. Or then doing repeatedly doesn't mean that they enjoy it. So basically, um, we sent a survey to the parents of the, of the participants to verify that these data that we were collecting on our maps actually reflected their preferences and emotions. Um, so we also give some indications in terms of the design of the workshop. Basically, spatial distribution is things that you'll find in the guide and that Raquel spoke about. We spoke about four types of materials. Um, the shelters would be the calm spaces that Raquel showed you. Landscapes are like circuits where you have like several pieces and they can be just like those ones that have the directions. So you do one thing and then the next one, or I'm going to show you images now, or that the child can choose their path and do many things. Mediating materials are those ones that you can give to a child at a certain moment and they are about sensory play or um, I can't remember the name, like playing dolls. Um, there's an, a specific word for this, and I can symbolic game we call it, but pretend play, I think it's in English. And then the rescue materials. This basically means that if your child is very cross, you can take their favorite toy from home. We recommend to have this hidden constantly, and you just take it out on the crisis moment. And, and that was what we call rescue materials. So these are the circuits that we created. You can see that each child does their own thing here. And they can choose how to engage with them. Um, and last, I'm going to say some words about facilitation. So when we think about workshops, we usually imagine that there's activity A, B, C, and we have to do these things. And this was not the case. Basically, you create a, an attractive space for them to play. They choose how to play. It's about not pushing them, letting them select when they start playing, how they do it. And basically, there were no speaking. Uh, our children were very young, and many of them didn't speak. So it was about facilitating through play. And I'm going to let it here. Um, and we presented to Dr. Nancy today in an event, and he was very from the local government, architects, and our 
is that this eventually gets integrated into the city policies and we think we're on the right path. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Blanca and Raquel, uh, for the presentation. And thanks all again uh, to all presenters for, for presenting their projects. Uh, um, um, they have been uh, really excellent, uh, very interesting, uh, thought-provoking, and, and showing uh, both the challenges that, that we face to make spa public space and, and, and place spaces more uh, and inclusive on the one hand, and also uh, pointing out to different solutions that, 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 that later on in the discussion we will, um, we will go further on, 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 on them and, and presenting solutions and an agenda for, for that. So for those who are listening uh, uh, these presentations online recorded, uh, this is the end uh since we will stop uh, recording for those uh, so thank you very much for for listening and and reaching uh this stage of the of the recording and for the rest that were that are live uh, in this in this project uh, uh we will start the second part of the of the of the event that is basically a round table a discussion a debate uh, between uh between us uh, so we will stop recording in this moment